I am the director of Broad Science, which is um, dedicated to making science inclusive, engaging, and intersectional through audio. And we're based in Montreal, Canada, um, at our local community radio station. Shout out community radio stations. CKUT, yes, say it again loud. I love community radio stations. Um, and we are available on SoundCloud, iTunes. I don't know if people use Stitcher, but we're there. Um, so what exactly is broad science? As you can see from our slide, uh, we have three ongoing projects. The first one is uh, we have a podcast, and every episode takes a deep dive on a specific science topic. And these are narratives that are driven by the voices and the perspectives of underrepresented folks in academia, but also voices within our community. The second thing that we do is we host story slams with our partners Confabulation in Montreal. And so these are live story, um, live story shows where diverse groups of individuals who have a connection to STEM in some way tell true personal stories. Very similar to Story Collider, if uh, some of you have heard of that. And then the last thing that we do is we host youth workshops. So we work with kiddos as young as eight and teenagers from underserved areas in Montreal, and we expose them to why science communication is important. They become mini science journalists for the day. They learn about how to research, how to create questions. Uh, they gain radio production skills. And then at the end of it, they meet a scientist and interview them on the radio to learn about their research, but who they are as a person. And so all of these three distinct projects we disseminate through uh, our podcasts and radio, so it's always accessible, even if you're not there. And I just want to, before we go on to, to more things that Broad Science does, um, I want to talk about why it started. And it really started with converging frustrations in my own life. And I say frustrations, a polite word um, being Canadian. <laughs> there are other words for it. But as I was going into grad school, I knew that there weren't going to be very many people that looked like me. And I was extremely right. <laughs> um, but beyond the is issue of isolation and the visible homogeneity that surrounded me, I was starting to struggle and confront more sinister and underlying problems with my research and classes. I was starting to question that science was objective, this objectivity that they keep feeding you, right, as students. Why was it that my data sets um, were primarily white participants? Why was there a lack of data on health outcomes for black youth? Why was it that I was studying medical models that disproportionately impact women, but we were studying it on male mice exclusively, right? And in parallel, I started to become really interested in science journalism. And these biases, and but I should mention that these biases are a direct product of the fact that scientists are human, surprise, right? They don't really teach you that in, uh, in your courses. But these biases were extremely clear in the media's representation of science, right? Where were diverse groups of people in telling science narratives? I was getting really interested in hearing um, and listening to podcasts at this time. It was a really great way of uh, filling time in the lab. Really loved uh, Radio Lab. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. And it was striking how diverse voices were made invisible. And not only that, when we saw people of color, when we saw indigenous folks, when we saw people with different abilities within these stories, it was always placed within a deficit framework, within a lack thereof, that there was something inherently wrong. So if science was not accessible, if it was not relatable, and on top of that, if it's been a tool to historically oppress groups of people, take away their knowledge and culture, then why should communities trust and engage with it? That is the question that I struggled with. So how, rather than trying to fit into the system, how can we dismantle a dominant and marginalizing, I love that Rabia emphasizes this when we talk, marginalizing STEM culture? And so how do we convey, in other words, that science is inherently intersectional, 
It's a political and social being, right? And if these stories weren't being produced, then I thought, well, maybe I can start producing them. Um, maybe I can work in partnership with my community to amplify the voices that we wanted to hear. And so I went to my local radio, community radio station. I got some friends uh, who were interested, and I pitched that we were going to start a woke radio lab. And we learned how to audio produce and make audio documentaries. And we used audio storytelling as an active tool of resistance. Because podcasts are one of the most democratized forms of media. They're, they're fairly easy to disseminate and access, right? And so this is now expanded to something that's bigger. But you know, we're not NPR yet. We're still, we're still working towards it. But what we've decided to do is structure all of our narratives within an intersectionality framework that is rooted in black feminism. And so I just want to go through what intersectionality means to us at Broad Science. It's a lens to question power. It's increasing representation of marginalized folks. It is highlighting the every day of science. It's humanizing it. And this is by creating an outlet to amplify voices in our community, to share their own stories, and to make that human connection. And it's to co-create an inclusive environment. And lastly, by telling their own stories, our community is placed within this empowerment framework. So our stakeholders are any, is anyone that we work with to produce um, our audio content. And they, they have various expertise that are all valued. We don't value the expertise of academics more than the lived experience of our community members. And rather, they're used to complement one another. And these asking people to share their stories, it, it's a lot. And so we recognize that even as people of color and, and, and we identify with different underrepresented groups in our team, that we have to earn trust, that it's not there. And sometimes this can take a few minutes. And for us, sometimes it takes up to four months of chatting. And what we always fall back on is we want any community member, anyone involved, to tell their own stories how they want in their own time. And so a really great example of this is from um, our story slam. Uh, and so that's Maya Hay. She's a PhD student studying fermentation. It always seems like a very benign question. I'm so sorry. Would you like bread for breakfast or rice for breakfast? But I know, as a five-year-old child, that that question sizes me up on my Japanese-ness. I may not know at that age what mixed race means, but I do know that how I respond to that question will determine how much that culture is going to let me in and how much they're going to push me out. Sorry to everyone's ears, but I thought Maya Hayes uh, message was important. And so she goes on to say, I don't fit into any culture. I'm not white, I'm not Asian, I'm not other. The thing is, microbes don't fit into one category either. And I love that because you might, you know, our general audience, and I, I'm not an expert on microbes, but what I do know is that I can connect with my story of belonging. I can connect with the power behind food, and I can connect with the politics and how it's central to her and her science, right? And so these are, um, some pictures from our story slam nights. And I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that with the increased diversity of our storytellers that that was reflected within our audience every time. And so lastly, I just wanted to touch on <laughs> our youth programming, um, which is very near and dear to my heart. So I've been working with youth for about 15 years now and started off as a camp counselor. and so. What I really want to convey is that we need to give young people the power to explore their curiosity for science. And we need to assume that they are capable. We often underrepresent um, 
children and their ability to understand complex ideas. And it, it it's, um, you know, hearing people say, we need to get girls interested in science. We need to get youth of color interested in, interested in science. They're already interested. Science is not interested in them. And that's what we need to change. And so this starts with early exposure to intersectionality, <coughs> early exposure to diverse scientists, talking about imposter syndrome and failures as much as we talk about successes. Because any scientist in the room, we know that that's our, that's our main gig, is failures. And that's what makes our science better. And we need to form partnerships. Um, we work with youth uh, community centers around Montreal um, and the Quebec area, which is our province. Um, we work with um, communities who serve uh, recently arrived immigrants and refugees. Um, we work with um, indigenous communities. And we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not working in silos. We're partnering together, just as we work with our community radio station um, and uh, confabulation. Uh, we're working in partnership to amplify each other and to lift each other up, but to make our own organizations better. Um, and this is a, one of my favorite co quotes from a 10-year-old who came up to me and said, uh, I love to be the one asking the questions for once. And that says a lot. So in summary, the key lessons that we've learned um, in the broad science team is that intersectionality it's an evolving process, and it needs humility. That storytelling is used, can be used as a tool. It's the most effective form of communication. And to always question, how am I empowering my community and the stakeholders that I'm working with? It's not to work in silos. It's to collaborate and to amplify each other's voices. And the fifth one I hope we can talk about in our panel is uh, to collect data. What does that mean exactly? Oh, I wish we had a whole other panel on that. Uh, but it's to collect what is meaningful to your stakeholders. And I just wanted to quickly end on, I know I'm over time, I'm so sorry, um, with a last audio uh, piece. Oh, that's, yeah, those are our partners. And that's my co-host, Lisa Favreau. Um, OK, hopefully this won't damage our ears. Join us this October for the first season of Broad Science, where we wind our way through the complicated social life of DNA. In my mind, limiting the definition of an indigenous person to DNA only is a very colonial concept. During the series, we look into the billion-dollar industry of direct-to-consumer DNA testing. The relationship between science and their ideology is a very urgent topic for a lot of white nationalists. I think they're looking for ways to justify what they see as truth. We ask, how did it get popular so quickly? Why do diverse groups of people use them? And what can those percentages really tell us about us? Why would African Americans in particular be willing to put a tissue sample in a FedEx envelope and send it to a laboratory and expect that this space of scientific analysis and inference could send back to them reliable information about who they are? We'll hear personal narratives about DNA and identity. His article was HuffPost right or horrified to find out that he was white, which was not true. I'm not horrified to find out that I'm why at all? I was surprised. We also asked leading academics in the field who shed some light on the impact of DNA testing on our society. They appropriated the land, they appropriated the mineral resources, now they're trying to appropriate our DNA or our biological resources into their settler claims to own and control and have the right to everything. Um, sorry for going over time, but I thought that this quote is important by Danielle Lee. Um, who says, inequality is not inherent, it's designed. Injustice, it's not inevitable, it's cultivated. And that's something that we think about a lot at Broad Science. So thank you for your time.